Ever wondered what end-to-end -end encryption is? Imagine Alice wants to send a private message to Bob. With end-to-end -end encryption, Alice's message is locked with a special key on her device before it leaves. This locked message travels across the internet, where no one, not even the messaging service, can open it. When it reaches Bob, his device uses a matching key to unlock and read the message. This process ensures that only Alice and Bob can read the message, keeping their conversation completely private and secure from eavesdroppers. In symmetric encryption, one key is generated and distributed to both the sender and the receiver via some key distribution protocol. The sender uses the key to encrypt a file that it sends, and the receiver uses the same key to decrypt the file. So, the word symmetric represents the fact that both the encryption and decryption are being done by the same key. In asymmetric encryption, the receiver generates the private and the public key. The public key is mathematically derived from the private key. However, deriving the private key from the public key is not feasible. The receiver then keeps the private key to itself and makes the public key publicly available. Now the sender uses the public key of the receiver to encrypt the file that it wants to send. Remember, once encrypted, the file can only be decrypted using the private key, not the public key. Upon receiving the encrypted file, the receiver decrypts the file using the private key. So, here asymmetric means that different keys are being used for encryption and decryption. What is a digital signature? Let's understand this with the help of Alice and Bob. Bob has a pair of keys called a public key and a private key. He keeps the private key to himself and makes the public key available to everyone. When Bob wants to sign a message, he first creates a hash of the message. Then, he encrypts or signs this hash using his private key. He sends both the original message and the signature to Alice. Alice receives the message and the signature. First, she generates the hash value of the received message. Then, she decrypts the signature using Bob's public key to retrieve the original hash. If this decrypted hash matches the hash value she generated from the message, it confirms that the data has indeed been signed by Bob and hasn't been tampered with. In cryptocurrencies, there are two sets of keys that govern transactions. One is called the private key, and the other is called the public key. The public key can be derived using the private key, but vice versa is not true. The private key must remain private, whereas the public key can be made public. The public key is then used to derive the address, which you can think of as a bank account number where anyone can send money. The private key is used as a password that proves ownership of the funds, ensuring that the funds being transferred indeed belong to you. The transaction function takes the amount being transferred and the recipient address, and it is then signed by the private key of the sender, ensuring the integrity and authenticity of the transaction before it is broadcasted to the network. Remember, if you lose your private key, you lose access to your funds forever, and if someone steals it, they gain ownership of your funds. Thus, safeguarding your private key is paramount to securing your digital assets. A zero-knowledge proof is a method by which one party can prove to another party that they know a specific piece of secret information without revealing the information itself. This concept is crucial in fields like cryptography, where it's important to validate knowledge or permissions without exposing sensitive data. To understand this better, imagine Alice has a unique key that can unlock a special lock. Bob, however, doesn't want to see the key itself, but needs proof that Alice has it. Bob gives Alice the lock and asks her to open it. Alice takes the lock and uses her key to unlock it and returns with the opened lock. By doing this repeatedly, Bob becomes convinced that Alice indeed has the key because she consistently unlocks the lock without ever showing him the key itself. This is analogous to zero knowledge proof, proving possession of a secret without disclosing the secret. In centralized systems, decision-making authority, control, and data storage are concentrated within a single entity, the master node. And all the slave nodes are dependent on the master node. If it fails, the whole network fails. One example of this could be the traditional client-server model. 
In decentralized systems, decision-making authority, control, and data storage are distributed across multiple nodes. In such systems, participants have greater autonomy and resilience, as there's no single point of control or failure. If a single node goes offline or encounters an issue, other nodes can seamlessly take over its responsibilities, ensuring the continued operation of the network. One example of such a system can be the blockchain technology. The OSI model is a conceptual framework that divides network communication into seven distinct layers. These layers, from the user-facing application layer to the hardware-centric physical layer, work together to ensure seamless data transfer. The application layer is the layer closest to the user, where applications like email and web browsers interact. The presentation layer translates data formats, so different systems can understand each other. The session layer manages connections between applications, keeping track of who's talking to whom. The transport layer ensures reliable data delivery by breaking data into smaller packets and reassembling them on the other end. The network layer determines the best path for data to travel across the network. The data link layer adds error checking and physical addressing to prepare data for transmission. Finally, the physical layer deals with the actual hardware, cables, radio waves that carries the raw bits of data. The TCP IP framework is a set of communication protocols used to interconnect network devices on the internet. It has four layers, each with specific functions. Application layer, this is the topmost layer where user interaction happens. It includes protocols like HTTP, SMTP, and FTP. It provides services directly to user applications. Transport layer. This layer ensures reliable data transfer between devices. The main protocols here are TCP and UDP. Internet layer. This layer handles the addressing and routing of data packets. The key protocol is IP, which determines the best path for data to travel across the network. It also includes protocols like ICMP, network interface layer, also known as the link layer. This is the lowest layer. It deals with the physical transmission of data over network hardware, such as Ethernet or Wi-Fi. It includes protocols like ARP to map IP addresses to physical hardware addresses. When you send a query on the internet, it goes directly to the destination via the internet and returns with the result. However, with a VPN, the process is different. When you connect to a VPN on your device, the VPN client first encrypts your data before it leaves your device. This encrypted data is then sent to the VPN server via a VPN tunnel, which ensures that your IP address remains hidden, adding a layer of anonymity. At the server, the data is decrypted. The query then travels normally to its destination on the internet. The result from the destination is returned to the VPN server, where it is encrypted again before sending back to your device. Finally, the VPN client on your device decrypts the data, ensuring that your information remains secure and private throughout the entire process. The surface web is the portion of the internet that is indexed by standard search engines like Google or Bing. It includes websites and web pages that are publicly accessible and searchable without any special configurations. Some examples are Wikipedia, YouTube, and news websites like BBC or CNN. The deep web consists of parts of the internet that are not indexed by conventional search engines. This includes private databases, academic and medical records, subscription-based services, and internal company intranets. Access to the deep web typically requires special permissions and credentials. The dark web is a small portion of the deep web that requires specific software, such as Tor to access. It is intentionally hidden and often used for anonymity and privacy, while the dark web is sometimes associated with illegal activities like drug trafficking. It also hosts legitimate uses such as anonymous communication for activists and journalists in oppressive regimes. In a brute force attack, hackers attempt to breach a digital system by systematically guessing passwords, trying every possible combination of characters until they find the correct one. To mitigate this risk, it's crucial to consistently employ longer passwords with a diverse range of characters. 
In a dictionary attack, the attacker uses a pre-compiled list of the most commonly and frequently used passwords. Imagine a list containing passwords like password123, sunshine, let me in, and ABCDE. The attacker systematically tries each password from the list, hoping one of them will be the correct one. Unlike a brute force attack, which tries every possible combination of characters, a dictionary attack is faster and more efficient because it targets likely passwords that people often choose. To prevent falling victim to a dictionary attack, use strong, unique passwords that combine letters, numbers, and special characters. Do not use nonsense like I love you. Enable two-factor authentication for an extra layer of security and regularly update your passwords to stay ahead of potential attackers. Typically, when you attempt to open a website, your computer sends a request to a DNS server to translate the domain name into an IP address. Once the translation is completed, your browser is directed to the corresponding website. In a DNS spoofing attack, also known as DNS poisoning, attackers manipulate the database of DNS servers by altering the IP address associated with a domain name to a malicious one. Consequently, when a user tries to access the website using the domain, they are illicitly redirected to the malicious IP address instead of reaching the legitimate destination, thus exposing them to potential security risks. In a distributed denial of service attack, a group of malicious nodes floods a server with so many requests that it can't handle them all. This overload makes the server inaccessible for genuine users trying to access it normally. The goal is to disrupt the server's operations, causing downtime or slowdowns that can impact businesses and users. Denial of service attacks use different techniques like flooding the server with traffic or overwhelming it with requests, making them difficult to stop once they start. SQL injection is a type of cyber attack where an attacker inserts malicious code into a database query via user input fields, exploiting vulnerabilities in the application to execute unintended commands. This can lead to unauthorized access, data breaches, and significant security risks. Imagine a website login form where users enter their username and password. Typically, the SQL query to check credentials looks like this. The query instructs the database management system to fetch the data from the database table where the username is Tom and the password is Jerry. Now the attacker might modify this to something like this, where the query becomes if the username and password or this condition, which is true, this will essentially make the whole condition true, and the query will return all rows of the table, effectively bypassing the password check and allowing the attacker to log in without a valid password. In normal communication, two nodes, let's say Alice and Bob, communicate. Alice sends a message to Bob, and upon receiving the message, Bob sends an acknowledgement back to Alice, indicating that he received the message. In a man-in-the-middle attack, a hacker intercepts the communication channel between these two. When Alice sends a message to Bob, the hacker intercepts the message and sends an acknowledgement back to Alice, pretending to be Bob. Alice thinks that Bob received the message. The hacker can then send a modified message to Bob, pretending to be Alice. Upon receiving the message, Bob sends an acknowledgement back to the hacker. That's how this attack works. The hacker may or may not modify the message. He might be there just for eavesdropping. In a ransomware attack, the hacker infiltrates a computer system using malicious software and encrypts the files, rendering them inaccessible to the user. The attacker then demands a ransom payment, usually in the form of cryptocurrency, in exchange for a decryption key needed to regain access to the files. After the attack, the victim is left with two options, either send the money and hope to get the key, or not send any money at all and lose access forever. In a cryptojacking attack, the hacker writes a piece of code that can mine cryptocurrencies when executed. The hacker then inserts the code into a compromised website or software using methods like cross-site scripting. Now, when the victim runs that website or software, the malicious crypto mining script is executed on their device. 
This script starts hijacking the device's CPU or GPU resources to mine cryptocurrency, operating silently in the background. As the crypto mining process runs, it performs complex calculations necessary to mine cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Monero, or Ethereum, with the mined cryptocurrency being sent to the attacker's wallet. The victim may notice their device becoming significantly slower, overheating, or having a reduced battery life as the crypto mining script consumes substantial computational power. A logic bomb is a piece of malicious code intentionally inserted into a software system that will set off a malicious function when certain conditions are met. They remain dormant until triggered by a specific event or condition, such as a particular date and time, or the deletion of a specific file. For example, consider a logic bomb set to execute at precisely 12. Once the clock strikes, the logic bomb will execute and carry out its payload, which could range from deleting critical files, corrupting data, or even shutting down entire systems. This makes logic bombs dangerous, as they can lie undetected within a system for long periods, only to unleash their destructive effects at a predetermined time, causing significant damage. Can you spot the difference between these two website names? It might not be clear, but the website above is the real google.com, while the website below looks like the real one, but actually is different. It uses Cyrillic O rather than Latin, thus giving the impression that it is just the same. In this type of attack, attackers register domain names that appear similar to legitimate ones, but use non-Latin characters or symbols that look identical or very similar to Latin characters. When users click on these malicious links, they are directed to deceptive websites that may mimic legitimate ones, leading to potential phishing or malware distribution. A remote access trojan, or RAT, is a type of malicious software that allows an attacker to gain unauthorized access and control over a computer from a remote location. Once activated, the RAT creates a backdoor for the attacker, enabling them to monitor your activities, steal sensitive information, capture keystrokes, take screenshots, and even control your webcam or microphone. RATs are often spread through phishing emails, malicious downloads, or by exploiting software vulnerabilities. They can cause significant damage and compromise your privacy and security. To protect your computer, use updated antivirus software, regularly update your operating system and applications, and avoid opening suspicious emails or downloading files from untrusted sources. Stay vigilant to keep your computer safe from rats and other cyber threats. Social engineering is a tactic where hackers exploit human psychology instead of technical flaws to trick individuals into revealing confidential data like passwords or credit card numbers. Through methods like phishing emails or phone pretexting, they manipulate victims into unwittingly providing access to sensitive information. One classic example, the attacker might call pretending to be a representative from a legitimate service or organization, claiming they need the OTP for verification purposes. Unwittingly, the victim might provide the OTP, thinking they're helping with a genuine request, but in reality, they're giving the attacker the keys to access their accounts or conduct unauthorized transactions. A computer virus is a type of malicious software designed to spread from one computer to another, disrupting normal operations. Imagine you download a file from an untrusted source. This file has a virus attached to it. When you open the file, it seems normal, but in the background, the virus gets executed. A virus needs a host, such as a legitimate program or file, to replicate itself. Once activated, it can replicate and attach itself to other files, spreading the infection across your computer. The damage caused by a virus can range from displaying annoying pop-ups to corrupting your data or stealing personal information. They exploit vulnerabilities in your software to gain access and execute their malicious payload. To protect your computer, use updated antivirus software, regularly update your operating system and applications, and avoid opening suspicious emails or downloading files from untrusted sources.